Robert Wig, I just want to thank you for uh, joining us. Really appreciate you giving a talk this morning. It's good to see you again. I feel very privileged to be able to do it. Um, it's, I think I'm blessed more than you, you are blessed, but we can discuss that after the talk. That's right. We might, we might differ on that, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, thanks again, Dwayne. I think um, we might as well get started here. Lucas, I've asked Lucas to give a little brief intro. I thought that'd be kind of a special thing. Um, Lucas, if you don't mind. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my son yesterday asked why Papa was giving grand rounds at, at Utah. And I told him his talk was on using innovation in an area that doesn't have much technology. And he said, that's probably easier for Papa because he he grew up when there wasn't much, when, when there where there wasn't uh, technology. So a little chronological snobbery there. Um, I think it's really been uh, a privilege for um, me to grow up with a dad that was an orthopedic surgeon. I think I've had, had different opinions on that over the years, but um, it's been fun to have my dad come visit Utah when I was in training and he's spent uh, time with many of you uh, in the OR and picked up different things. I think that's one of the things I'm proud about my dad is He's continued to evolve and learn and innovate over the years. And so even though as he gets closer to a time when he's considering retiring or cutting back, uh, he continues to learn and innovate, whether it's learning the stop approach from Higgins or anterior hips from Gilland and I, uh, he continues to change and grow. So uh, we've had a relationship, uh, our University of Utah with Ethiopia and the Soto Christian Hospital, Haller, Lisa, uh, Kapczynski, myself, Dr. Stotts, uh, Nick Bernthal from UCLA and some of his residents have gone to visit. And so one of the reasons I was hoping my dad would give grand rounds is just to one, kind of illustrate what you can do in another world, in another area of the world, but also um, maybe inspire some of our residents and attendings to go visit and and uh, help train his residents and, and fellows there. So with that, I'll hand it over to Dwayne Anderson, my dad. Thank you, Lucas. Uh, it's been a privilege to learn from all of you. Um, as Lucas uh, thanked my mentors at the University of Utah, I thank you as well. Uh oh, I want to advance. Okay, here we go. I have no disclosures. Um, I want to dedicate this talk to two of my mentors. Roby Thompson and Ed Craig. Roby uh, is pictured here. He was the chairman of my department in, uh, at the University of Minnesota. He was a demanding individual, kind of created fear in us residents. A uh, little fear is good. And um, he always made it very clear if I didn't know the anatomy that I wouldn't operate. And uh, he was a tumor surgeon. He knew anatomy backwards and forwards better than anybody I'd ever seen. And uh, he was the chief editor of the Master of Orthopedic Surgery First Edition. Similarly, Ed Craig was my mentor. And uh, if I remember one clear thing is that is if you don't know where you are in the shoulder, look for the base of the coracoid. And that has been of an immense help, as you'll uh, understand from this talk. He is still the editor of the shoulder edition of that same book. This is where I live, Ethiopia, which is in the Horn of Africa. Um, I can see on a very clear day, I can see 125 miles across the Rift Valley. There's a lake there where you see Owasa, um, and uh, I can even see some islands. 
uh, not on that lake, but an adjacent one, long ways away. I'm at 6,800 feet, six degrees north of the equator. And if you no longer want to ski, but you just want to enjoy warmth, this is the ideal place to live. The Ethiopian people are diverse and yet uh, very beautiful. Um, diverse cultures, diverse languages, four language groups, 80 plus languages. Um, a lot of them are poor, unfortunately, and um, that affects what we do in this country, probably more than anything, is the poverty of our patients. These are my Ethiopian partners, so I've had the privilege of uh, help train. Um, and each of them, in their own way, is really becoming a, um, a, a wonderful, dedicated, gifted surgeon. What does resource limited mean, anyway? Um, does it mean that I, I can't use uh, the brand locking plate that I want? Or um, Stryker no longer supplies implants to my hospital? Um, does it mean that the C-arm in my room is no longer working? Or the CT scan in the hospital? I started out here without a C-arm and without a CT. And it makes you humble in terms of a surgeon. But you learn how to do a hip pinning. Uh, you may have, have to take them back once or twice more than you wanted, but it makes you a better surgeon. Is your OR too small or is it just plain too hot? Well, really, when it comes down to it, the biggest person that's affected by a low resource environment is the patient. We see it from our perspective, but in reality, the person who's really affected, really affected is the patient. So I'm just going to talk a little about something you've probably never even seen. I found this image on the internet, but I, I searched Google Scholar and PubMed and couldn't find anything on distal tibial traction. Now, what I thought was Apley's traction was not this. It's when he treated proximal uh, tibia fractures, plateau fractures with traction, he did it like two inches below the, the fracture site, not where you see it here. Um, I've had two very distinct patients treated with uh, distal trivial traction. This, this one's about from six months ago. Came in with uh, undiagnosed tuberculosis of both hips, both knees. And he was given pre uh, prednisone to accelerate the process. And um, he, another person came in, this is maybe 10 or 15 years ago, very tall individual, again, with severe flexion contractures of the hip and knee. The former fellow, the one from 10 years ago, he walked out fully upright in a normal gait. This person's now out of those casts, but he's going to need probably joint replacements of all four of those joints. Okay, when I first came to Ethiopia in this town, the major mode of transportation around town was a horse cart. Now, 10 years later, there's lots of paved roads and there's hundreds of motorcycles. Well, you can imagine what that means to a young 18 year old boy that has a new motorcycle. They come in with just exploded tibias. And I can remember when we had relatively low volume, I would plate these posterior, lateral, double plating. And then I thought, well, maybe I shouldn't take so much risk. And so I started doing minimal internal fixation and external fixators. And then I remember the time very distinctly when I didn't have an external fixator. And so I did minimal internal fixation and distal tibia traction. Now you're probably all into dual plating and locking plates, but you have to remember who my patients are. Now they might be able to have a plating but, and the money to take care of that initial hospitalization, but if they get an infection, they're just completely destroyed. And so it's not just about the implants, it's about the complications that you might have. And with this type of treatment, our complication risk is less. Here's an example, motor vehicle accident, young male, closed fracture, you see initial x-rays and then in traction, he's better aligned, he's reduced. You can see some of these that come in and actually dislocated and improved with distal tibial traction. So this patient uh, had this minimal internal fixation, 
then this setup uh, on the ward. And that particular day, he was one of five. All five of them had this kind of treatment. Okay, so what else could be different? Well, when you, when you compare the treatment of both bone forearm fractures throughout the world, pretty standard treatment is double plating. Well, if you buy your implants from Synthes, which I used to do um, from Switzerland, it was like $260 just for the implants. And that's like five or 10 years ago. Indian implants are not as good, but they're much cheaper. But for the very poor patient, I can make a high quality homemade rush pin for one to $2 per implant or two to $4 for the forearm. This is high quality US made stainless steel. It doesn't break. Okay, so you can see I was kind of improvising. This is maybe 15 years ago. Uh, I had uh, that threaded guide pin for one, and then I probably had just a lone homemade rush pin. And this person was uh, trying to break up a fight between a hyena and some children. And uh, he got the short end of the six, so to speak, and this is his treatment. He had a fair result. He had about 50% of his normal rotation, but he had his arm. Now, there are other bites that we could talk about, but um, hyena bites are pretty significant in themselves. Okay, so my, my, uh, I've evolved in my insertion point and the way I do these things, and this is kind of where we're at right now. We've moved uh, alternately on the insertion point of the radius, um, and we try to get a straight drive retrograding through the electron so that it's completely straight right down to the wrist. And uh, so this is what we use commonly for our bulk bone forearm fractures, whether they're closed or open, and it works well. Here's a high velocity gunshot wound. Now you might be tempted to, uh, to plate this, I wouldn't. Um, you probably would put an external fixator on it. The way we handle this is with uh, those rush rods, uh, a cement spacer and an abdominal flap. And within one month, we had uh, two patients like this treated. Now, if you get an infection with a plate, the plate falls off. If you get an infection with an intermedullary rod, it kind of festers, um, but it doesn't fall apart. You know, the other thing that you can do is, this is a three month old neglected Montasia fracture dislocation. They've come later than this, but let's say you've got a lot of callus at the fracture site there and you try to plate it. And I've seen some world-class elbow surgeons in my hospital, try to plate a situation like that, and your whole external anatomy of the ulna is distorted. How do you contour the plate? How do you make it anatomic? Well, the way I do these is I use the intramedullary canal. And something that's length stable, I retrograde drill out through this fracture here, out through the tip of the electron, that it gives you a straight shot, then place the nail down here after reaming. Um, but for the first step is to open up the lateral elbow and get this anatomically reduced. Your assistant has to hold this absolutely perfectly anatomically, and then you can get a good result, whether you plate it or whether you rot it, as in this patient. Okay, now we're gonna transition to uh, chronic dislocations because that's something that we see commonly here. How do you think about it anatomically? How do you think? understand the pathoanatomy, how do you plan logically and sequentially to solve very, very difficult problems? Well, anatomy is the key to understanding pathoanatomy. Okay, so it's maybe not intuitive, but this is what you see if you were to open this anteriorly, is the psoas is draped right over the acetabulum. You think, well, duh, that does make sense. Well, your patients push you to solutions. Um, there's this 60 year old lady with a chronic shoulder dislocation. And I can remember when I first came to Ethiopia, I did not have 
very good internet. In fact, I had dial up email and it took forever to connect. So I had no, no resources other than the textbooks I brought. And I can remember vaguely reading about chronic shoulder dislocation. And it said, basically cut the rotator cuff and put it back into place and pin it. Well, I knew that that wasn't a very elegant or very good long lasting solution. However, I remember my first vivid experience in Cameroon openly reducing these and getting it reduced, but the elbow was out here at the side, like, you know, 45 degrees of external rotation. And I was thinking, you know, I can, I can, I can bring that arm down to the side. And I did, and I watched the head just kind of crush. So you can get things reduced. It doesn't mean that you can have a normal shoulder after that. So it really opened my eyes as to the difficulty of these problems. So we have a booming chronic dislocation practice and I'm operating less and less and my young partners are taking over. In 2021, we had 24 chronic elbows, 14 chronic shoulders, seven chronic hips. Chronic means in our practice more than six weeks, but in reality, you can't reduce these closed um, except by extraordinary means past three weeks. We commonly see these patients at three to nine months, 18 to 36 months is not infrequent. And we made a mistake by not getting a clear history and reduced a 10 year old dislocation, not a 10 year old patient, a 10 year old dislocation, which of course didn't work out very well in the end. Okay, so if I have a specialty, it's chronic dislocations. And you can see that would be formidable for any surgeon, whether you're a sports doctor or a trauma doctor or whatever, at three and a half months, seeing that kind of displacement. Each has its unique anatomy and challenges. The elbow, hip, and ankle share the fact that they, if you can restore the reduction, um, the bony anatomy gives you a lot of stability, whereas the shoulder and the knee share the fact that there isn't so much bony stability as there is soft tissue stability, as there is more normal translation in the joint. The overarching principles of shoulder of chronic dislocation surgery is that muscle shorten, nerve shorten, and everything fibrosis. When bones do not articulate, they soften, they erode, there's bone loss and distortion. Cartilage also degenerates at variable rates, and I think that's probably genetically determined. And the strength of its attachment to the underlying bone also weakens, which is not maybe intuitive. Scar tissue matures and strengthens. And I can remember two distinct examples of the distal humerus with chronic elbow dislocations. One in a maybe about a 10 or 12 year old boy where I got the elbow open and I was peeling the scar off of the distal humerus and the whole articular surface of the distal humerus was like an orange peel in my hand. It was just a complete anatomic specimen of the articular surface. And I looked at it, I thought, well, I better put it back on. I gently reduced it, closed him, and of course he fused. The other was about a year ago when I was helping a resident do a chronic elbow dislocation and he got it reduced and he didn't realize that this was a difficult situation and he just went like that and the distal humerus just collapsed before our eyes. It's challenging. Okay, what's the goals in chronic dislocation surgery? To reduce the joint concentrically, that makes sense to try to produce stability on the table so you can begin range of motion as early after surgery that is medically wise, to find that safe zone in, on the OR table and then start that motion. If you're unable to find stability on the table, then you need to either cast them or pin them or both to prevent it from subluxing or dislocating. And of course you wanna prevent neurovascular injury, remembering that stability and motion are essential. If you have just a nice x-ray and a joint that doesn't move, nobody's happy. Everybody knows that. So here's the history of chronic elbow dislocation surgery. In 1925, 
Dr. Speed described his VY triceps takedown and advancement. Um, and that gets you to the, the elbow as quickly as you can. It gets you to where you want to go, but then in the end, your triceps is contracted because with an elbow dislocation, they're about here in about 10 to 15 degrees, they go like that. So your triceps is a powerful friend if you keep it intact or if it's a powerful enemy if you take it down. In 1940, an author in the JBGS says, well, an option certainly is excision. In 77, Krishna Worth, he, uh, surprisingly from China, did a medial lateral approach. He spared the triceps and had about half good results. And I think he had half good results because he didn't mobilize them quick enough. In 82, um, there's an author and um, that did 21 patients from posteriorly, three of them couldn't be closed. There were five ulnar nerve injuries that were resolving, meaning he never transposed them. He pinned them for two weeks. Half of the motions uh, patients were good and half of them were fair. In 2002, Jesse Jupiter reported um, using a medial lateral approach, but with one incision, he did not repair the medial side at all. He just took it down and three out of the five, he did a lateral soft tissue repair. And then he put him in an elbow external fixator and started motion as soon as he thought it was reasonable. A rebuttal of that uh, article came in 2015 that noted many complications of an external fixator in that type of application. In 2017, we published a paper, that meaning the University of Utah, the Mayo Clinic, and two institutions here in Ethiopia about our uh, way of dealing with chronic elbow dislocations. And I'm gonna share that with you now. Okay, so you think about the elbow, it's basically a hinge joint with a, ro a rotating limb but it's basically flexors and extensors at the elbow itself. Okay, to get this thing reduced, you have to remove all soft tissue attachments to the distal humerus. In a child, to keep the periosteum intact, in the adult, you can take it down. You remove the scarf within the olecranon because it's totally filled. There's an adherent scar. You reduce it concentrically, and then you do a ligament reconstruction by closing that anterior and posterior sleeve around the epicondyles. Um, and then you always transpose the nerve because it's short. And then you move the elbow as soon as you can about three days later in an arc where you feel it's stable. Okay, so here's the medial and lateral approach. I tell my, my residents, you have to cut through what's white. Don't cut through red. So you can go down here through the lateral side, splitting the, the flexors and the extensors, then you cut diagonally across over the radial head and neck. Medially, you go right down the center of the supracondyl ridge, and then you go posteriorly so you can preserve the attachment of this strong friend of yours that you want to preserve. Here's the repair of those uh, anterior and posterior sleeves to the epicondyles. You can see I really like a deep, deep, uh, transposition of the nerve. That's my, my preference as, a, as opposed to a sub Q. And um, so this young man had a dislocation for 13 months. He had about 25 degrees of motion preoperatively. At eight months, his male elbow score was 95. He had that amount of motion and full supination pronation. Okay, chronic posterior hip dislocations. Okay, in 1976, Nixon published three cases where he approached chronic hip dislocations and says that was an easy operation. And he had good results. I don't know how he thinks it's easy, but maybe he's an excellent surgeon. 1979, Epstein um, had good results when he did total hip replacements or hemiarthroplasties. Uh, unfortunately, he only had three out of 10 good results with femoral head sparing operations. In 1984, uh, two studies published pretty much near the same time an in injury used heavy traction to reduce delts up to six months. And a landmark article in the Journal of Pediatric Surgery, Gardner et al. used the posterior approach 
The dissipations were four to 36 months in duration. Age range was five to 10. And they shortened everybody. And the follow-up was 33 to 51 months, all with excellent results. So as you can see, femoral shortening is a key part of dealing with chronic posterior hip dislocations and trying to preserve the head. Okay, the head sits out between the piriformis and the conjoint tendon usually, and the iliopsoas lies over the acetabulum. The capsule turns into a well-developed, unyielding trampoline over the acetabulum. That pressure of the capsule inverts the limbus and all the muscles are shortened. It's difficult. The, unique, the hip is unique in that the muscles that cross it are really, really strong. With time, as you can see from the CT scan, the head softens. While the scarring process mature, there's very strong attachments between the periarticular uh, soft tissues and the bone and the muscle. And this extends for six centimeters or more in all directions. It's a difficult surgical problem. So I tried a posterior approach, trying to preserve the, the, the posterior external rotators. I found it frustrating and difficult. And then it dawned on me, well, stupid, you can go anteriorly. Uh, and the acetabulum will be right there in front of your face. So that's what I did. I took down two and a half centimeters of the distal insertion of uh, the anterior insertion of the gluteus medius. And you're staring right down on the iliopsoas in the trampoline. Okay, it's clear. Okay, so now you've got all the acetabulum cleared out. You've excised the capsule, you've inverted the labrum, you've mobilized the periarticular muscles, then you try to reduce it. And it's still difficult. Well, Lucas came in uh, 2014 and while he was here for one month, we did two chronic hip dislocations that he did. And he suggested, why not try the GANS flip? And so you can see here an operation with an obviously unbelievable view of the acetabulum. So for most of these, we have gone to the GANS flip. But just a GANS flip doesn't, doesn't always get you there. You've detached the abductors, but you've got all those other muscles that cross, that cross the joint essentially, and they're short. So femoral shortening is absolutely essential. Removing two centimeters can make it to where you're physically impossible to get it down to reduction, to being able to, with two fingers, rotate it in. It's just absolutely unbelievable. So summary, bony anatomy, in some dislocations creates inherent stability. Everything shortens around it and the bones soften. So it's difficult. Chronic shoulder, there's less inherent stability. It's like the knee. This is the history of chronic shoulder dislocation treatment. There's a 1911 paper that describes taking the subscap down and the pathology. I did not have an English translation to access. In uh, 1935, there were 14 cases by a surgeon in the Southern United States where he approached this the same way and he casted them in the salute position with a, with a shoulder, hip spike, or shoulder spike of cast, all of them with poor motion. The visor in 48 did the same anterior approach, basically a circumferential dissection of the of the glenoid and screwed them for three to four weeks. He had good x-rays, but he had stiff patients. In 82, Carter Rowe described his treatment options, one neglect with poor results, head resection, open reduction, and trying to keep the native head or amyarthroplasty. Over the last 20 years, there's been more and more papers about it. Of note is that in the JBJS in 2016, a ladder J procedure by itself, if you took down the subscapularis, did not fix the problem. There was a 50% dislocation rate with the ladder J procedure. 
So just increasing the surface area of the glenoid is more complex than that. So here's a 15 month old anterior dislocation. You've never faced it before. There's limited information out there. How do you plan the operation? Where are the muscles, tendons, nerves, et cetera? Well, the anatomy screwed up. What approach will you use? Will it be extensile or limited? Will you take the subscap down with an osteotomy or just the, and where is the nerve? Okay, so this is the protocol that we've developed. Take down the anterior delto uh, deltoid from the clavicle, get a big open door, osteotomize the coracoid, open an inner door, take down the subscapularis without bone, mobilize the soft tissues around the base of the coracoid, specifically the, the subscap and the supraspinatus, mobilize the head into external rotation, circumferentially release the capsule and the rotator cuff at least one centimeter back from the rim of the glenoid. In other words, free everything up, okay? Mobilize the interval between the posterior cuff and the posterior deltoid. That's still sticking together. Release the undersurface of the acromion, pulling the posterior deltoid anteriorly. So the deltoid is even pulled anteriorly because it's been sitting there so long. Mobilize the subscap as far immediately as you can to get as much excursion as you can. And excise the heterotopic ossification that the body naturally forms on the anterior aspect of the scapula as a neoglenoid. That also prevents the subscap from really moving in a normal way. Then you need to stretch the posterior cuff. It's not just enough to relieve it, you have to stretch it. Okay, stretch it as hard as you can. Now, if you're Samson, you can't do that because you pull the shoulder off. But for us average people, pull it as hard as you can laterally with the elbow at its side, just basically trying to stretch the posterior cuff and the supraspinatus um, from its shortened uh, length. Okay, then reduce the head and see where it sits without doing anything, any further surgery. Most of them will sit in a sublux fashion anteriorly. Okay, if, you, if you're not confident that you can hold that reduction by repairing the, the subscap, because basically in all these, there's no differentiation between the subscapularis and the capsule and the, the labrum. It's all kind of welded together. So then you repair the subscap, the coracoid, and the deltoid in that order. Okay, so from experience, you understand that if you try to operate on these in a very difficult tight operation, you're just going to beat up the anterior deltoid. So why not just take it down? And so that's what we do is we take down the deltoid all the way up to the, to the lateral acromion. It takes longer, but it gives you an easier trouble-free exposure. And then many of these, the head is fixed below the coracoid. It just doesn't move. And the neurovascular bundle is extremely close. Taking down the coracoid is like opening another door. It gives you more exposure, deeper. Okay, so pre-drill the cor pre coracoid, osteotomize it, and you have easy access to the rest of the humeral head. Don't osteotomize it, because if you, if you osteotomize it, you weaken a weaker head. It's just like a crack in an egg. It's just weaker. Avoid entry to the supraspinatus. It's wrapped around the base of the coracoid. It's embedded in all this scar. Its course is distorted. You don't know where you are. It's like a scar ball. I mean, you have to know. That's why the base of the coracoid is so essential. Everything is scarred to everything. Okay, these are the factors that favor continuing anterior subluxation in the early post-op period. Obviously, the bone is, you've lost bone. The posterior deltoid is adherent to the posterior acromion. There's scarring between the deltoid and the posterior cuff. The posterior cuff is tight. And to bring it down to just a simple phrase, there's soft tissue memory somehow that just wants to push that head out. I don't think the hill sacs is important in the early post-operative period because I don't externally rotate these people for six weeks. 
So here's a case, open reduction at 12 months after dislocation. He was dislocated for 12 months. You can see his healed coracoid osteotomy. His head looks symmetrically reduced, at least on this view. And he's got a shoulder score of 100. Dislocated for one year. Okay, so we want to start a protocol where we CT both, CT both shoulders to determine the glenoid size loss, follow the protocol I've just outlined, pin all the glenohumeral joints just before closure, CT after uh, wound closure, make sure that it's concentrically do, reduced and pull the pin at one week and follow for one year. I'm done. Well, Dwayne, that was fantastic presentation. Thank you. Um, we, we have plenty of time for questions. Maybe I'll start. Um, can you talk a bit about perioperative management, preoperative discussion with patient and family, um, postoperative pain management process there? Um, what are the patient expectations, family expectations? How are patients cared for in the post-op time period in and out of the hospital? That, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, I have to I have to thank the University of Utah for this because is it Dr. Stevens at the outpatient surgery center there, the anesthesiologist? Swanson, yeah. Swanson. Swanson. He taught me how to do ultrasound guided brachial plexus blocks. Okay, so I I don't know when that was, but it's a long time ago. So I came back. And I, I taught all my anesthetists how to do this, a, uh, a supraclavicular brachial plexus block. And all those shoulder surgeries are done now with a, a brachial plexus block. So, um, you know, we put whatever we can to prolong that block, which also probably predisposes to subluxation in these patients. Um, but I would say that for the most part, Ethiopians are used to more pain than our culture. And so most of these get a combination of tramadol, ibuprofen, and paracetamol, which is acetaminophen, and they're happy. Now, not everybody is, but um, now in response to another part of the question is how do I communicate with these people? I, I, I poorly communicate. There's 80 languages here, 10 spoken in this hospital frequently. I can't even, you know, I talk like a one-year-old uh, in the local languages. So it's like, I'm not doing any of that. But so I think that, that my partners share the, to the best of their ability about the risks. And um, for the most part, I would say that, you know, we use spinals and we use long acting spinals and we use supraclavicular blocks. We rarely use general anesthesia. And I think that helps. The other thing is, in addition, I always put local anesthesia into the incision. I've had like seven surgeries. So it gives you an appreciation for pain. I think Lucas can probably tell you some stories about me. I had a bilateral total hip replacement on the same day. And I, I guess I was a baby. Um, at least that's what he says. So does that answer all your questions? Yeah. And um, yeah, I guess um, getting a sense of the sort of the pain threshold is, is helpful. Um, understanding sort of how families engaged in patient care postoperatively and, you know, which is different in different countries, you know, less significant here than I presume there or in other countries I've, I've talked to folks about. Yeah, basically we require an attendant to live in the hospital compound while they're an inpatient. Rarely do we have exceptions to that. So they're helping to bathe them, uh, remind the nurses about meds. We don't have workable call buttons. Exactly. The call button is, is the family. <laughs> do you have a... Do you have a process by which you keep track of your outcomes so that you can do talks like this and report back and learn from it and learn from your patients? Yeah, we're getting better at that all the time. Um, you know, we're, we're starting, 
some prospective studies that will help us a lot. You know, we do have EMR in the last year and that helps a lot. Um, I have, you know, I have patients back for 17 years on paper charts. Um, it's like the US, they change their phone numbers. And the other thing that makes things difficult for research here is there's no street addresses in Ethiopia. It's near the, it's near the, uh, the brewery, something like that. That's the address. That's even in the capital city, there's no street addresses. And no zip codes. Wow. So fortunately, however, there's tribal zones. And so people tend to stay because of the civil war, they tend to stay in their own tribal zones. So that if they move, it's not very far. But retrospective studies are difficult. Anybody else with any questions? I have a question for you, Dwayne. This is Andy Tischer. Um, this is maybe a little bit personal, but can you talk a little bit about what stimulated your interest to do what you do? Well, it's um, you know, an unusual tract in life, but I think in a fantastic one. I'd, I'd just like to hear your thoughts about how this started for you. Well, it happened when I was probably around 12 years of age. I grew up in northern Minnesota and, and uh, a little a little mining town and my parents went to this little Baptist church. It's really cold up there. And um, one Sunday night, this Indian nurse who was a missionary, uh, an American nurse who was a missionary to, uh, to India had a slideshow about her work there. And I just felt like God was saying, that's what I want you to do. And it was, you know, it wasn't an audible voice or anything like that. It was just like I had this really sense that this is what God was calling my life to. And so um, that's what I dedicated my life to. And, um, you know, Lucas's grandson uh, teased me about living a, in a disadvantaged time of life. But I grew up. In, on the Iron Range in northern Minnesota in the 60s, it was rich. I mean, I had a shop class from the time I was in the seventh grade to the time I was in 12th grade. Drafting, metalwork, sheet metalwork, lathes, welding, carpentry shop. Uh, I mean, I had it all. I mean, I, I had a privileged education as a... Uh, as a middle-class blue collar family, my dad was a minor. So um, my grandson uh, is not gonna have that opportunity that I had. And, you know, I don't know how much of that plays into my abilities now, but it certainly didn't hurt it. I guess the other thing that, that comes to mind is, um, you know, we, we give our children blocks at at age one and they start piling them and then we give them puzzles at three and four if you give a 12 year old in ethiopia a puzzle they don't know how to put it together my residents have never touched a power tool before they came here never can you imagine never having picked up a power tool my dad my brother and I built a house together when I was growing up on the Iron Range. Sheet metal, cement work, everything. I mean, we, we built the house, basically. I mean, what other kid has that kind of opportunity in the world? How many? So I, I think it gives you a perspective of my resonance challenges. I mean, unless they're from a very wealthy family, they never played with blocks. They never had a power tool in their hands. So it's, it, it's totally different here. But my residents are brilliant. I mean, 
I stopped taking the weekly test because I was embarrassed. The weekly exam, I'm not taking it anymore. They're too, they're too smart. Great, thank you. Any, any more questions? Hey, Dad, do you want to talk about, Dad, do you want to talk about your uh, kind of plan going forward in, there and the kind of transition and uh, kind of a legacy piece as far as what you're going to leave behind? Um, what, what you built as far as residency and uh, whatnot? Well, it's, it's, um, it's been a privilege to get a, a when I when I first came here 17 years ago, we had a general surgery right out of the residency, right out of the box. And I was teaching uh, general surgery residents how to do total hips. And they're like, well, might as well. I don't have anything else to teach. And then fortunately, um, you know, we started a residency. We, In fact, one of my partners is our first graduate, Tomeskin. He's the one, the small guy that you saw in the one of those early pictures, he's the one that embarrassed me about not taking the test anymore. He was just, he's just such a superb test taker. I, I can't beat him. And so um, I helped train the other two guys um, probably for six months during their residency. And um, so people are attracted here because of the diversity of surgeries that we do. You go to the big city of Addis Ababa where there's, millions of people well there's you know that's where all that's where everybody wants to live and so the resident experience there is not very good um where my residents are doing you know we do we do three thousand cases a year and uh up to this point we've had one resident a year so you can you can see what that translates into the next year we're taking two but I tell you, my first year residents can can do a tibial nailing blindfold. Um, they just have a lot of surgical experience. Um, Tomeskin, my um, my youngest partner, he's doing ACLs. I told Lucas about seven years ago, I'm never ever going to do another ACL because I could do three femurs in the time I can do an ACL. Well. I'm helping Tomeskin do ACLs, much to my pain. I mean, it's hot. If you can imagine something at six degrees north of the equator in the middle of the day, the windows are closed. I mean, I'm just sweating bullets. And um, so I'm trying to leave a legacy of a full-fledged residency where, where the residents get the very best of education. Um, we now have, um, a neurosurgeon that's a part-time partner with us. He does about an instrumented spine about a, a week. Um, I'm trying to gear up our, um, joint replacement to where, where we have just one room dedicated to joint replacement with the goal of having four a day. Our biggest challenge is getting adequate numbers of implants. Right now we had to shut our total hips down because they don't, they don't have enough heads. And uh, our suppliers just, uh, I won't mention the name of the American company, but it, they're being very difficult. Um, so our trauma, I mean, we see complex pelvis and acetabulum all day long. Um, a lot of open injury, a lot of gunshots. So my goal is to leave a uh, residency here that trains the very best surgeons in, uh, in Ethiopia. And I'm not interested in training a lot. I'm in, interested in training a few that are superb. And um, my goal is to gradually, I'm operating less and less, assisting more and more. I do an occasional first surgery operation, um, but mostly I'm assisting and seeing patients in clinic and monitoring, monitoring my, my, my partner's outcomes and uh, teaching uh, in the clinic and teaching in the OR and teaching in conferences. So my goal is to gradually transition where I'm not doing any surgery, being an advisor and a mentor. And I hope to do that, whether it's being physically here or being there, 
I mean, I think if you really want to make an impact in people, you got to be their friend. And my partners are my friends. And um, so I want to, I want to give them the legacy of being friends to their residents and their future partners, because I think that's, that's the way to make a great institution is your partners, be your friends and try to be honest about your failure. And my partners are, um, and so the legacy I hope to leave is a strong residency with high numbers of procedures for each resident that will make them superb and that it will last much longer than my life. That's, that's the hope of my legacy. So I'm tr transitioning now to six, six months here, six months uh, in the U.S. And that's a that's a great legacy to leave. I, I noticed Thomas uh, was going to say something. You still have. Uh... Yeah. I, I, uh, uh, thanks, Gerald. And uh, Dwayne, thanks. That was a great talk. And uh, one thing I noticed in your practice over the years and in your x-rays is that there's the tendency for the occasional developing world surgeon. I would count myself among those. Um, sometimes you get in a situation where it's low resource and you just say, you know what, this isn't what I want, but it's going to do. And you kind of settle you. you I, I kind of settle, but you have not done that clearly. And you hold it to the same standard that we would hold here. And is the key to, I've always assumed the key to that is just, I mean, and I'm saying this in complimentary fashion, just pure stubbornness. Uh, is there any, uh, what, uh, what else have you figured out over the years to like, say this, we stick to, we stick to, you can call it the Western standard, whatever you want, but you've done that. And what is your key to that? Hmm. Probably stubbornness and pride. Um, but also a desire to, to the very, do the very best I can for the patient with as least complications as I can. As I thought about this talk, you know, I thought, well, what relevance does it have to somebody in the United States who has every implant known to man plus some? And I think about the, the obese diabetic that comes in with a, you know, a shattered plateau or the HIV positive patient with, you know, a really shattered extremity. And then I think that you have to say, you know what, I can make a really nice x-ray or I can do something a little bit more cautious and still get a good, a great result. Now, I have some videos of, of these patients treated with, you know, these complex proximal tibia fractures at three weeks and the fractures are stable. It doesn't mean that some of them don't collapse into varus or valgus, but you know what? The joint doesn't collapse, you know? So if they, if they go on to a malunion, it's an osteotomy through metaphyseal bone rather than, you know, rather than uh, some horrible periarticular infection that destroys the joint. Uh, I've seen just a few of those, but I've seen the disaster. And I, I guess I've just been forced. You know, I tell my residents, number one, if, if your patient doesn't have a complication, they go home and tell 10 people how good of a job that you did. If you go... If you go home, if you, that patient has a complication, they tell 20. And the person that has the complication is 10 times the work of the one that ha didn't have a complication. So try to avoid complication makes, makes your life easier, makes you a more popular surgeon, and you got less work. In other words, you can do more elective surgery rather than taking care of some some terribly unhappy periarticular infection. Think, I've had the privilege. Finding... I've had the no, privilege. I'm... Go ahead. I've had the privilege of, of working with Sean O'Driscoll. And um, he said that your first, 
your first your first priority in a periarticular injury is don't infect the joint. And I, I think that that's spot on. Sorry to interrupt. I think you. That sweet that sweet spot between compromise and doing so much that you cause a complication is super hard until, or it remains super hard, but I think it becomes easier the more experience you have and, uh, you know, you earn judgment the hard way, but uh, you seem to have, uh, have figured out that spot. And I, I guess it's, it, I guess it's stubbornness plus time. Let me ask you a question. Let's say you were, Let's say you were, I don't know how many complications you have in complex plateau fractures. Hopefully you don't have any. But let's say you started a prospective study where you had, you know, you randomized treating, uh, treating like I have done and then treating your standard way and see which patients are happier. Dwayne, you, you may well be right. Like, I remember I gave a talk on Kenya in Kenya about uh, bicombat plateaus. And, you know, I showed her results. And they're like, you can't, <laughs> surgeons there uh, defendably said, you can't do an operation that's got 10% complication rate. That's ridiculous. And, you know, I mean, they're right. Um, yeah. And, and I don't, yeah, that's, it's, it's the dividing line that we're talking about is about where, and uh, yeah. And I don't, I don't know that I can, I can randomize folks here to traction, um, but, but there is some. It's going to take a lot of courage. Uh, yeah, yeah, it would. But, but let's say you just randomize the ones that you put at higher risk, the ones that had comorbidities, diabetes, and you just offered the patient, you know, you don't have to be part of this, but yeah. I mean, traction yeah. pins are not allowed complications. I have to be honest with you there too, but right. you know, it's fairly distant from, from, from the operation. We haven't had any disasters that I could think of. But I mean, we're, but by the grace of God, we all, we all can have a major complication tomorrow and be really unhappy. One of the things that strikes me about what you're saying, and I'm thinking about, okay, how would we do that? How would we put patients in traction? How would we keep them in the hospital? We, we have such a beds or space shortage. We have such a nursing shortage right now. Uh, you send them home. Yeah, we don't have a culture where patients tolerate that kind of thing, or that, or or, or patients' families um, don't have expectations that they're actually caring for a patient. Uh, yeah, it almost takes a culture culture shift to be able to manage to do not just not just the traction, but actually maybe do some of what we're doing today when we don't have even the resources we need for today's care here. Yeah. You know, I think an external fixator, the reason I stopped an external fixator was two. One is I ran out. But more importantly, you have a patient in an external fixator. They say, I can't move the knee. Look at the metals coming right out of the skin. That's why my knee is stiff. I'm afraid. It hurts. I mean, that's the advantage of minimal internal fixation and traction is, I mean, the traction pin is so distant from their pain that it's, it, it's, I haven't had anybody complain about it. Interesting. But I think you're right. It, it takes a, maybe it takes World War III to get us to that point. God forbid. Well, Dwayne, I want to thank you again. It's been a, a wonderful hour and really appreciate it. We've learned an immense amount from you. Thanks for joining us. Well, it's been a pleasure to give this talk. Appreciate it. Have a great day. Thank you so much. You too.